Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let's hear it. Good afternoon. Right on. My name is Nick Cowan, and um, I've been on staff with Strange Loop since the second year. And uh, I've been asked to introduce the illustrious, the genius uh, that is my friend Alex Miller. Yeah. So I first heard about this idea for a conference when he and I were at a gig at the pageant, which was the venue that actually the second Strange Loop was at. And we're sitting there waiting for, uh, uh, for, I think, Ani DeFranco to play. And he says, Nick, with his arms like this, you know, kind of the way that Alex sits sometimes, and says, I've been doing all these meetups. I've got this land lounge thing. I'm thinking I could get a couple hundred people to show up to the conference. I'm like, you know what? If anyone's going to do this, man, it's going to be you. And he did. That first year was 300. Then he brought me on the second year. That was 600. The third year, 1,100. And then it's... I don't know how many thousand since, since then. And it's been remarkable for me as a kind of an outsider, because I'm not a developer. I'm just a friend of Alex. That's my official designation for Strange Loop. <laughs> and uh, to watch the way the culture of this conference has changed and to see how much more focus has been put on being inclusive and accepting and hearing all the talks. Yes. And this was a conscious decision from him to do that. This wasn't accidental. This was, you know, things can be different. We can make them better. And with him as the figurehead, he inspired us and the rest of us, us on staff and all of you here to be better, not just at our jobs and our roles that we have in life, but also just as people. So let's put your hands together for Alex Miller. Thank you, sir. You got it, man. Hi, I'm Alex Miller. I created Strange Loop. <laughs> the date was October 22nd, 2009. It was a cool, cloudy morning when I packed an entire conference into my car. All the signs, badges, lanyards, programs, shirts, AV, supplies. I had enough stuff I had to borrow my mom's car uh, to carry it all. Uh, I banged out a quick tweet before I hit the road. I was working remotely at the time and had forgotten how much uh, I hated hot stop and go traffic. And uh, I was going down the road and before I knew it, I was stopping, the person behind me was going and I was in a fender bender. Uh, oops, sorry mom, broke your car. <laughs> so I pulled over, we called the cops, exchanged info, I did all that stuff. And uh, probably created a timeline split at that point because maybe I wouldn't have made it to Strange Loop, I don't know, if something had happened differently. but. Uh, uh, I was on my way to the Tivoli Theater, which was uh, where we had the first Strange Loop. And when I first con conceived of this conference, I tried to imagine sort of my favorite time of year, my favorite places in St. Louis. And uh, I really wanted to do it at the Tivoli in the fall, and it was happening. Uh, the Tivoli opened in 1924. It was a wonderful three-screen movie theater in one of my favorite areas of St. Louis, the Loop. Uh, I paid them a thousand bucks to host the event for a day and a half. Uh, that included free popcorn and our name on the marquee. Um, so <laughs> very cool, right? Uh, so where did this idea come from? Uh, for that, we need to go back a little further. Uh, December 4th, 2008. It was a peak time for uh, meetups and early tech Twitter. I don't, so hopefully some of you remember that. I, think, I, I feel sad that we've lost some of that, um, both of those. Uh, and there were all kinds of buzz about dynamic programming languages like Ruby and Groovy and new functional languages like Erlang and Clojure and Scala and F Sharp. And people were starting to experiment with these crazy NoSQL databases. Um, and after a long period of enterprise stagnation, uh, companies and developers seemed sort of open to new ideas. Uh, and I was the member of a bunch of little um, sort of splintered user groups talking about these ideas. Uh, and it seemed like we needed something that was more of a big tent, uh, where we could bring people together and really start to hash that stuff out. And uh, out of that, uh, a local meetup called Lambda Lounge was born. And uh, immediately brought people together from all of these different groups. And it was one of the most vibrant tech communities I've ever been a part of. 
uh, in the first year, we had topics on uh, Ruby and Clojure and JavaScript and Monads and F-sharp and Factor, if you remember Factor, uh, Perl 6, Haskell, Phantom, if you remember Phantom, uh, Scala, and more. So uh, the first meeting was December 4th, 2008. Uh, the presenters that first month were Matt Taylor. He was talking about groovy metaprogramming, and I'll talk about Matt later on in the presentation, and Ryan Sr., who talked about OCaml. Um, and Ryan eventually became a co-organizer of Strange Loop, and he's, he's here today and has been helping me run it for a long time. Uh, but that meeting was the first time I met Ryan. Um, so stepping forward just a little bit to February 5th, uh, 2009, um, my uncle Al passed away. So bear with me, this will connect in a minute. Um, I could do a whole talk about Uncle Al, but I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Um, Al was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease when he was a teenager, um, and they told him he would likely die. Uh, he stubbornly refused to do so, <laughs> and ultimately received three kidney transplants and lived 64 amazing years. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll pass on to you his plea to me, which was to sign up as an organ donor. Um, throughout his life, he was a wildlife photographer and an activist and a woodworker and a furniture maker and a teacher and many other things. He did a, 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 an amazing series of art furniture pieces called the Dieter's Candy Dishes. And there were all these tables that made it very difficult to get things off the table. They had big spikes or they were wobbly and you had to, they were like really wide and you had to lean over and then it would, you'd fall over and stuff. It was crazy. He was a, he was a, he was a great guy. Uh, has anybody here from Portland or been to Portland? Some people? So Portland has an amazing Audubon Society up northwest of the city and an, also a wildlife sanctuary, Oaks Bottom, uh, near downtown. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has been to those places, but they exist um, in a significant part because of Al. Uh, he loved birds and wildlife and um, was one of the leaders of sort of an idealistic group of activists in the late 60s and seven, early 70s in Portland pushing to protect those places. Um, so he had, uh, did a lot of different stuff. So on March 7th, I went to Portland for a sort of celebration of his life at the Audubon Society there. And for hours, I heard person after person describe how Al had started some important group in their life, or even more frequently, had convinced them to start a group, which is like an extra level superpower. Um, and so he spent his whole life connecting people through their passions. So, um, I returned from Portland that year, resolved to do my own version, but I needed a name. So what do you call a conference that's in St. Louis, in the Loop area, about programming with things like loops? And weirdly, I had this book on my nightstand, uh, and I thought, that seems weird enough, but also connected enough that maybe that could be a good thing that would, you know, maybe it would stick out in your mind a little bit. So that's where the name came from. So back to, back to uh, Strange Loop, October 2009. Uh, really planned for about 150 people, but uh, 300 people showed up. Um, the early bird ticket price was just $75, and I think it went up to maybe 110 by the end of the, uh, end of the season. Uh, it was catered by Quiznos Sandwiches. Um, <laughs> that was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, I did all the AV myself, terrible idea. <laughs> so I learned that lesson. Uh, but it really was sort of like my Twitter feed uh, showed up and hung out for a couple days. Uh, and that was awesome. Uh, the keynote speakers that year were Alex Payne, who was, work, who was sort of uh, well known at the time because he was working on the Twitter API. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the other speaker was Bob Lee, who I'm, I will talk a little more about later. Um, so we had an amazing party at the Blueberry Hill Duck Room and that night, and we did sort of non-tech talks with a borrowed projector perched on a chair, um, and uh, there were a ton of people packed in there, and it was very punk rock, do it yourself. Uh, and I knew that that was, we probably weren't going to be small enough to do that again, um, but uh, it, was, it was a great time. So my theory of the case here is that uh, the three things that really make a conference special, and they really sort of reinforce each other, are context, content, and people. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. Uh, context is uh, largely about the venues, um, but also about the fact that we are sharing the same physical space. 
And we're all here together experiencing this. Uh, and importantly, you're not at your other places. So um, this notion of the third place is a thing that can't, uh, was originated in a book by Ray Oldenburg. And so the, uh, the first place is your homes where you live. And your second place is where you work and work with your colleagues. And the third place is sort of your, the place where you go for sort of public relaxation. It might be regulars, it might have new people, uh, but it's kind of that kind of place. And I think Strange Loop is very much a third place. And I'm sure you have other third places in your life. Um, and I think the pandemic really made us discover what those were <laughs> more so than anything else because that's what we missed. Um, so choice of venue is really important. Um, I've always tried to find venues that are beautiful and that has store, have historical resonance and are interesting and just put you in this frame of mind to really sort of open yourself up a little bit. And so obviously, I mean, this is great, right? Um, but uh, you know, the Union Station was at one point the, one of the largest train stations in the world and 100,000 people a day pass through there. It's, a, it's kind of a, a, a building with a lot of history and, and the Tivoli, same way as a, another great, great old theater. City Museum, obviously, a few of you probably experienced that last night. Uh, not really like anything else. Um, so, and it also is a little bit about format, about like single track versus multi-track and things like that, but uh, that's less critical. So that's what I think about context. It's important to put people in that, in that zone where you can think about things. Um, if you talk to your employer to get approval for a conference, you probably mostly talk about content, and that's sort of the thing that drives a lot of um, a, a lot of things in, in the conference, whether it's you know sort of the big name keynotes or the sessions or the hands-on workshops or the ad hoc sort of birds of a feather kind of things. Uh, over the years, we have had over 5,000 CFP submissions, um, over 1,000 talks and workshops at the conference. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> um, Strange Loop has become really well known for its talks on YouTube. Uh, certainly, that has been the best ambient marketing channel we, uh, we could have we could have imagined. Um, I love playing with uh, format and trying to figure out if there's some different way to do, do things in the conference. Um, it, it ends up mostly being sessions like this where you've got a speaker talking to everybody and that's because that's what scales. So when you get big, that's really the only thing that scales. Uh, I did create another whole conference called Lambda Jam where I tried to explore sort of long form interactive uh, type sessions and uh, uh, I gave up uh, because I could, <laughs> I could not figure out how to make it work without losing money on it. Uh, it, was, it just doesn't scale in the same way, so you either have to make it really expensive or, um, uh, or not do it, <laughs> which is what I did. <laughs> so um, from the beginning, uh, the goal of Strange Ship really was to mix sort of uh, people who are you know, hardcore industry people working on you know, important stuff um, with big thinkers from academia and with the hope that sort of those people got to got to mix a little bit more and, and uh, you know, mix a little of the chocolate and the peanut butter together and maybe they would both come away with some interesting, uh, interesting things and, and uh, I definitely think that we have succeeded in that. Uh, and I also really wanted to combine sort of a dash of humanities and interesting places that software was going that were maybe not obvious. Uh, you know, we've had talks about, you know, knitting and origami and all sorts of different things over the years. Um, the whole world is interwoven with technology these days, and, and we, us as software people, we're everywhere. Every job is a software job, right? Or, or every business has a, has a software component to it these days. And I think it's important that we, as the people who are making that stuff, um, think about how we respect digital rights and privacy, privacy and freedom of expression and, and sort of encourage people to be more human and not less human. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, so back in the early years, I used to collect speaker feedback uh, or feedback about talks from the attendees after the conference, and uh, I wanted to share a few things out of that um, that I think are maybe not obvious, um, but are interesting, and I have no place else to share those things, so I'm going to share them now. Um, so uh, the first thing is that I used to do this question where I'd ask people just sort of open-ended question, what were your like three favorite talks? And then you sort of you know, note those all down and, and come up with you know, a list of them. And I thought, oh, I'll just come, there'll be some like, obvious like, favorite tracks and uh, you know, I'll make a list or something like that. Um, and uh, I, I did some of that. It wasn't interesting, but like, the interesting thing was that every single talk of the conference was on the list. So 
Uh, that is not obvious, right? <laughs> Um, and I did this multiple years, and I had the same result every time. So um, there is no best talk. <laughs> it is truly subjective. Everybody here has, is walking into the room with some sort of problem you're wrestling with, some place where you need inspiration or a decision or information, and uh, you might go to some talk, and it's like, you're like, that's the perfect talk. <laughs> that's my talk. That was the talk that was a perfect talk for me, and that talk is different for everybody. Um, so I don't think that's obvious, but if you're a speaker, I think that's really encouraging to hear um, because you might think, oh, well, you know, I didn't do as good as, as, good as that other person did or whatever, but, be, but you connected with somebody. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, and then uh, another thing is that uh, multi-track conferences are sort of choose your own adventure, right? Um, we all go to different conferences, right? You go to this talk, I go to that talk, you know, everybody goes to a different set of talks, and one person might say, oh, it was the best programming language conference I went to, and they would say, I didn't go to any programming language talks, I went to all database talks or whatever. So, um, so the feedback that I get all the time is, 80% of the talks I saw were great, but the other 20%, you gotta get rid of the bottom 20%. But you gotta remember, if you go back to the last point, there is no bottom 20%, right? It's the talk that's right for you at the right time. So, um, so that's bad advice. Don't follow that advice. Um, you, you should still try to get good talks. <laughs> that is important, but, uh, but don't follow that advice. Um, and then uh, the other interesting thing I found was if you read all this feedback and, and tried to take take away from it, like what's, what is, uh, what makes for a, what, a, what is the reason somebody doesn't like a talk? It is 99% of the time, this is very Buddhist, it's because the expectations that they had for the talk don't match what they got in the room. And so it's really important, especially the title, but also the abstract, to, um, to sort of make sure that you're matching those expectations. And people are incredibly forgiving, actually, uh, if you are matching sort of the content expectations, but you know you have slide issues or AV issues, or you know you're you're not the best speaker in the world, all that kind of thing. Um, if you're if you're actually matching the thing that they were looking for, that might be the talk they need. So um, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, I also wanted to talk about. Uh, we're still talking about about content here. Um, this is uh, something I I really needed to talk about. One of the weirdest and wildest moments of strangely. Uh, was uh, 2013. Um, so obviously the conference is named after the book, kind of, uh, kind of, the I Am a Strange Loop book. And uh, the author of that is Douglas Hofstadter, who also wrote uh, Gerd Escher Bach, which was a Pulitzer Prize winning book, um, and was very important to me uh, in thinking about things. And uh, he joined us for a keynote. And um, the way that happened is that Daniel Friedman had uh, spoken previously and they were colleagues at Indiana University. And so I asked Dan, I said, how should, how should I invite Douglas Hofstadter? He's like a big guy, you know, like, and, uh, and he said, you should write him a letter and I'll give it to him. And I was like, oh, all right. So I wrote him a letter and invited him to the conference. And so uh, that worked. So uh, it's, but probably the hand delivery helped a lot. <laughs> um, and that same year, uh, I sent probably the weirdest cold email that I've sent. And I've sent a lot of weird cold emails. Um, to a guy named David Stutz. And uh, David is a composer, and he's kind of interested in the overlap of mathematics and programming and music. And he has all these interesting projects he's done. Uh, and in particular, he had written this album of music called Iolet, which was um, uh, sort of a companion work to uh, Neil Stevenson's book, uh, Anathem. If anybody, uh, has anybody here heard the Iolet album? A couple people I see out there, so you should go check it out. It's like kind of like uh, so. Anathem like has all these um, sort of uh, uh, monastery-like things where people are are separating themselves from the world for a long time. So there's lots of sort of sort of monkish Gregorian chant kind of vibe to it. And so the album is very much like it's like a Gregorian chant songs that are about an algorithm for approximating the digits of pi, stuff like that. So <laughs> it's awesome, it's really cool. Um, so I didn't really have a proposal for him. I was just like, you do all this stuff, and it seems like it vaguely overlaps with all of my interests, and maybe there's something we could do. I didn't, and I didn't really even know what I was proposing. 
Um, but he, he was immediately very interested in, in doing something, and I mentioned that, you know, Hofstadter was going to do the keynote, and he said, oh, I love Hofstadter, and so he, he knew, you know, he knew all about Hofstadter, and, and he, so he started working on something, and he came back to me, you know, a month later or whatever, and he said, so I've been working on this, and I think, I think we could do a theatrical piece about the themes from Douglas Hofstadter's books, and I was like, that sounds amazing, <laughs> like, I don't know what that would be like, but sure, go for it. And so he kept working on it a little bit, and then he came back and he said, I need a, you know, a few thousand dollars or whatever to hire people and do stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So, um, so we, we worked that out. And, uh, and uh, so he hired a cast, uh, and then he contacted me and said, uh, is there any way you could find me a brass band in St. Louis? And I was like, yeah, sure. So, so I found him the Great Gateway Brass Quintet, a fantastic group. And, uh, and then uh, he's like, uh, if I had an aerialist, who was hanging from the ceiling, <laughs> is there anything, that, would that work out okay? And I'm like, yeah, I think that would work. So <laughs> like, they've probably done stuff like that here. Uh, and so I asked him and then, you know, the venue was like, well, you're gonna need insurance for that. So, let's say, so somebody could fall and land on somebody. So, it's, so I actually bought some aerialist insurance or whatever the hell you buy, so I don't know. <laughs> it's one of the many weird things you have to do as a conference organizer. So. Um, I didn't actually speak to him uh, until uh, right over here where he walked on stage, basically, um, because they, they came in town, they did a dress rehearsal, but I was off doing other you know, conference stuff or whatever, and uh, as, as I said hello to him for the first time before he walked on stage with this crew, he said, uh, he said you have to be the most trusting person I've ever met. <laughs> like, <laughs> So that was fun. So uh, this is uh, almost, almost 10 years ago to the day. It was like 10 years ago and two days ago. I was sitting right over here uh, next to Douglas Hofstadter watching this theatrical piece with a brass band. And uh, he, was, he had a closure ruffle up and he was like triggering things on closure, through closures, all these images and sound. And uh, there was a cast and, and all that stuff. And it was like an hour long piece. It's like a theatrical piece. Um, and it was totally original and, and funny and incorporated all these themes and, and Offsetter was eating it up. He was, it was great. Um, and uh, I thought, I just, I don't know how we ever beat this. <laughs> like this, is, this has got to be peak strange loop. So um, I think we've done some good things since then, but I don't know if, we'll ever, if we ever beat that. But you can go watch it online if you Google for uh, uh, Throne for a Loop. It's on Vimeo, uh, the full recording. We had the whole video crew here. We did a multi-camera shoot of it, and, so there's, and he edited it all, and we, we have a great uh, video that came out of it. Um, so go check that out. Some people really hated it. So, uh, and, uh, <laughs> so, but I, you know, art's supposed to provoke a reaction, so I'll, I'll take that. So. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about people. Um, one year, uh, it was the night before the pre-conference, and I ran into Rich Hickey in the lobby of the hotel. And uh, I've worked with, well, I had not worked with him at the time, but I have now worked with Rich, you know, almost since then uh, on closure stuff. Um, and, and he said, oh, congratulations on a great conference. And I was like, it hasn't even started yet. We're just in the lobby the night before, you know? And, uh, and he said, no, you know, look around. Like, uh, the people are here, you know? This is it. This is the conference. So, uh, and he was right. Uh, he was right. Uh, so the content gets you here. The context sort of sets the stage, and you all do the rest, right? Uh, on the subject of people, uh, having had over 1,000 talks, obviously, we have uh, lost a few beloved members of the community over the years. And I wanted to talk about a few of them, uh, just three of them um, tonight. Um, the first is Joe Armstrong. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Joe Armstrong. <clears throat> so uh, Joe is uh, you know, one of the creators of Erlang and the author of a really excellent book about concurrent programming that I found very influential. Um, and he gave a keynote at Strange Loop in 2014 uh, and I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of sort of programmer royalty over the years, and uh, Joe was just a joy to talk with. Uh, he loved learning and teaching, and um, uh, one thing that I've found to be common among these sort of luminaries is that they are really good at finding good problems, and Joe certainly was that. Uh, so I miss Joe. Uh, Matt Taylor, I mentioned earlier, um, I knew him through a, a bunch of various tech meetups, notably the very obscure St. Louis Dynamic Language Beer Drinkers and Hellraisers Club, which still, <laughs> still occasionally meets. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was an enthusiastic early supporter of Lambda Lounge, uh, and he spoke at that first meeting and spoke at the first Strange Loop and several after that. Uh, and he eventually moved out to the West Coast and worked at Yahoo on the Mojito framework and then um, joined Numenta, uh, who work on uh, the sort of model of the brain stuff. Uh, and he was a really passionate member of that team and, and really sort of built a thriving community uh, around that. And uh, he was a really deep thinker, and I always enjoyed having conversations with him about life and universe and the heavy metal, <laughs> all sorts of things, and uh, uh, I miss him a lot. Uh, and then finally, Bob Lee, I'm sure lots of people in this room know Bob. Um, he was killed in a, a shocking event earlier this year in San Francisco. And he was well known for his work on Android and Java libraries like Juice and a CTO of Square. And, but before all that, he was born in St. Louis and he was here in the local tech scene and particularly around Java, which is kind of where I got to know him. He had a library called DynAOP that was an early dependency injection library that was, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, and he was a keynote speaker at the first Strange Loop and gave several talks later on with uh, people like Eric Burke and Josh Block and people like that. Uh, and he kind of, you know, uh, left St. Louis, but also came back and left and came back and kind of circled in and out. Uh, and I always used to run, him in, run into him in the airport um, going between San Francisco and St. Louis because I was working for San Francisco companies too sometimes. But uh, my heart really goes out to his family and, and uh, I miss him a lot. Uh, and uh, this is the whole organizing crew here, here with uh, uh, Adam Savage. Uh, this is uh, Crystal Martin, who is actually not here uh, this year because she just had a baby. <laughs> um, but she's been missing us for sure. And me, Adam Savage, Nick Cowan, who introduced us, Bridget Hillier, uh, Ryan Sr., and Mario Aquino. Um, And I will, I will bring them all up later at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Um, but uh, I know because people have been telling me this nonstop for the last two days that um, Strange Loop has really uh, had a big impact on a lot of people. Uh, whether it's sort of meeting people, meeting you know, Twitter folk online, in person or famous people or finding a job or getting introduced or inspired to do something um, or just getting stuck in a tunnel at City Museum. Uh, for me, uh, it was all of those and finding this set of dear friends. Um, we, we get together every year and, and get to catch up on our lives and all that. So uh, I don't know what else you could ask for. So I hope you've had some of those experiences at Strange Loop. I know that you have. Uh, okay, now it's time for some real talk. Um, when, you, when you shut down a conference, you can tell the dirty secrets, right? Um, so <laughs> this is our uh, sort of attendance over the years. Um, uh, as Nick mentioned earlier, we started the Tivoli with about 300, then moved to the pageant with about 600, and then moved down here downtown to the Hilton Ballpark with about 900. And then um, at somewhere around there, uh, Stiefel, which was then the Peabody Opera House, uh, reopened after a big rehab. Uh, and I knew that we had to be here because they had this beautiful theater. And there's also four side ballrooms. And so you could do breakouts in it and everything. And, and uh, we sort of, uh, you can see the, the attendance kind of crept up over the few years. And that's because we got better at running it here. And we were able to sort of better balance um, uh, the rooms and feed people better and do that kind of stuff. We just improved a little bit. But it was becoming increasingly hard to get tickets. And so like in 2016, I think I sent one email and the conference sold out in five minutes. So it was, <laughs> which it like, it like, oh, that's awesome. Like it really, it really is, is uh, I really hate being sold out like that and having to deal with wait lists and telling, you just tell people no for months on end. It's, that's awful, it's, it's really horrible. Um, so we took the plunge in 2017 and split into two venues and started using Union Station for uh, breakouts as well. And that gave us a little more flexibility. Um, so um, 2017 uh, was really great. That's the year we had Adam Savage here and that I think drove, drove a lot of attendance. And uh, 2018, um, 
ICFP co-located with us, the International Conference on Functional Programming. And that was largely due to uh, Matthew Flatt and Robbie Findler who had that, had that idea. And so I appreciate that. I think that was a really interesting year. There were just a, there was a lot of different mix of people here that year. That year. Uh, 2019 was a hard year. So I know it doesn't look like it's that, that, that line on the graph is much lower. Um, but it's the difference between losing money and making money. <laughs> so it's um, when you're running two venues like this, there are a lot of fixed costs, and so you and you doubled them. You don't you don't uh, you don't get that uh, that benefit, uh, the economy of scale benefit. When you start adding venues, <laughs> you lose that again. Um, so uh, I really sweated that year a lot, and we I, we didn't make any money that year. It was it was pretty much a uh, I think about I, I I I'm afraid to go back and look at taxes and see whether I actually made money that year or not. Uh, and then 2020 obviously was a pandemic and uh, I was already, because after 2019, I was already replanning the conference and, and probably gonna do just Union Station anyways uh, to try to keep it um, sort of a, a, a something that was uh, not losing money. Um, and then, uh, so I kind of replanned everything around that and then uh, the pandemic started and I thought, well, yeah, I guess, I, you know, hopefully this will blow over in a couple of months and, and we'll be able to have the conference. But I replanned the whole thing again for us planning for an, a smaller event. Uh, and then after a couple of months, it was clear that that was not gonna happen. So we canceled the event and, and, and took a loss that year. Um, and uh, I, I canceled the event on my birthday that year. Um, and I remember calling, you know, our captioners and, and video crew and and telling them that we weren't going to be able to use their services, and I felt really bad because you know their that their businesses are built out of our business. So um, that was a that was a hard decision. Um, I was not able to cancel my hotel contract. Um, it would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that, uh, but they were able to move it until this year. So we're actually using the 2020 contract this year at Union Station, um, it, which is a common thing. Um, but I really, really going through that period of 2019 and 2020, uh, and, and I was able to, and so I didn't do the conference that year in 2020, and, and it was, it, it was kind of nice, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was kind of a nice breather. Um, but uh, I decided that I was not gonna actively continue signing contracts, because usually sign the hotel contract three years out. So like that, that, the contract we're on now, that was supposed to be for 2020, I signed it in 2017. So that's just to give you an idea of the, what, how this works. Um, so uh, in 2021, it was obviously really small, and um, it, uh, it, we had a ton of cancellations at the end. We we're kind of right at the, the back half of the Delta wave for COVID. And so we had a ton of cancellations, a ton of sponsor cancellations. We had like 20 speaker cancellations. It was just, it was like constantly like replanning the conference on an hourly basis. But we did have it. Uh, uh, I only had, I, I think I only had one reported case of COVID that year. Um, and that might have been a false positive even. Um, so I think it was successful in not being a super, super spreader event, which was my first, uh, my first goal. Uh, and people were just overjoyed to be back talking to other people. So it was a kind of a special year in that way, um, but didn't make any money, obviously. Oops. Uh, and then in 22, um, in 22 we, we got bigger again, and, and uh, everybody was trying to hire at the beginning of last year, so we had a ton of sponsorship, but attendance was really low um, because um, people had not opened up their travel budgets again. Just the economics of this stuff changes. Uh, and then, you know, doing fine this year. We decided that uh, we had to go out and use the steeple again, so brought that back this year. Um, all right, I wanna talk about diversity stuff a little bit. Um, the, uh, and before I get too much into this, uh, I'm committing graph crimes here, so I will explain them. I'm also committing, committing some diversity crimes here, and so I wanna explain those too. Um, I know, I hear you, um, if you have that reaction immediately. So these are all the numbers on here are percentages, but not of the same thing. So graph crime, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to put things together. Um, I will explain a little bit. Uh, and then the other aspect of it is there's a bunch of things on here about women, and that's because that's what I can uh, easily infer proxy statistics for, for some things. Um, and so, uh, but uh, I know that 
diversity is not just about uh, women. It is about the full, awesome, intersectional you. And I see all of you out there, and that's awesome. Uh, I just don't have any numbers that I can put to any of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and the way this is calculated is based on looking at like first names and t-shirt selections and the fact that I know a lot of people at the conference. And, and so there are error bars, particularly on that uh, green line uh, for sure. But I think it's still, uh, you, it's correct enough, accurate enough, um, and calculated the same over the years that the trend line is, is useful. So uh, I decided it was worth showing this, so don't cancel me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, explaining these a little bit, the sort of top line is really uh, the percentage of talks that have women speakers. And, and uh, you'll notice that in 2009, that number was zero. So the first year of the conference, there were no women speakers. Uh, this was not something that I thought about at the time. So uh, it was a different world then. Uh, and I think if I, if I put that program out today, I would be pilloried, and rightly so. So uh, I think the world has, has definitely changed for the better that way. Um, and it is something that I sort of uh, uh, became more aware of <laughs> quickly, and then it became a priority, really, uh, for us. And you can see that um, on that graph that there are, there's a big jump there, and, and uh, it, is very, it has been very easy at Strange Loop for years to go to a conference, and if you're in that multi-track thing, if you wanted to, you could just see only talks by women, so, for example. So, uh, I think that we have, um, and that's not accidental. We put a lot of intentionality into that as we, as we choose speakers and invite speakers and all that kind of thing. And I'm really proud of what we've done there uh, to, to promote that. Uh, and then the bottom line, the yellow line, is about grant, grantees. So we have this opportunity grant program uh, that we've been running since 2015. And I had some ideas about this uh, in, you know, sort of a year or two before that. Um, that it would, be, it would be great if we could, you know, really sort of encourage more people by, you know, just bringing people to the conference <laughs> uh, and, and encourage a, a lot of different kinds of, di of diversity that way. Um, and uh, Bridget Hillier, who had been to the conference a bunch of times and who I knew, uh, came to me and was interested in doing something like that. And I said, oh, yeah, like, I'm interested in doing that. So um, we got together and sort of designed this program. And there, weren't a lot, there wasn't a lot of precedent, I don't think, at the time um, for that in the tech industry at least. Um, but we, we, so we fumbled our way through it, <laughs> got a lot of recommendations from Ash Dryden and other people and, and uh, tried to, to do our best at, to, make a, uh, to make a program that would, that would uh, just, just sort of change the, the way the conference looked and, and felt. Uh, so being welcoming to everybody and bringing more people in. Um, and so we ran that for a couple years, um, and then uh, there's an a organization called Project Alloy that uh, was interested in doing the same kind of thing, but more on a cross-conference scale, so like getting much bigger donations uh, from, from companies and, and building sort of a bigger program. And so they kind of took over the organization of it for, for a few years, uh, and that was kind of an interesting learning perspective, and we, I think we learned from each other on that. Um, and then post-pandemic, we've sort of gone back to doing it ourselves. And um, one of the things that has always been, a, we, from the very beginning, Bridget and I talked about this being not a thing that was going to exist forever. Like, the goal was really to change what was happening here um, and provide that support. And then eventually, we wouldn't need it as much. And we have really stepped things down a lot. Um, and it's a little hard to see from this because, um, because the grantees is... Uh, as a percentage of attendees, and you have to remember the last graph where the att number of attendees was going up rapidly. So um, in those peak years of like 2017, 2018, we were bringing, you know, 140, 150 people and paying all their hotel and travel. And uh, so it was, a, I mean, we had a lot of sponsors and I kicked in a lot of money and uh, we really made it a priority of the conference. It was a, a big chunk of the budget. Um, so I think, but I think that what we've seen is that uh, the result of that grant program is that those people who came on the grants um, are amazing people. <laughs> I mean, like, these people submit these, you know, we submit forms or whatever and tell us about themselves, and it's just like, oh my God, like, this, <laughs> this person is so much more capable than I am in so many ways. Uh, but they just couldn't afford to go to the conference, so I'm so glad that we were able to make that happen for them. Uh, and we, what we see is, like, a year or two later, we see them coming back 
uh, and they've been hired and they're bringing their team with them or they're, they're convinced their company to sponsor or they're submitting talks and speaking, and which has happened a whole bunch of times. Um, so it definitely was really good for the people that attended. It was really good for the conference. It was really good for, um, uh, for, for all of us for that to happen. And so the, it, it repaid all the money that we put into it, I feel like, uh, came back to us with a multiple, uh, for sure. Uh, and then the green line in the middle here is women as a percentage of attendees. And so this is, I, I think, so the other two lines I think are places where we're doing stuff, right? And the green line is sort of a, a metric of one of many possible metrics of, you know, how are we doing on this? And I think definitely you can see that that has changed over time. Uh, and so I'll take that as a, as a measure of success. It's a little bit of an indirect proxy, but um, I think we definitely have, uh, have moved the needle on that for sure. Um, and then this is kind of an interesting graph that I've been using internally for years. I've never shared this with anybody, but um, I use this for sort of tracking ticket sales over time. And so the, the x-axis here is days on sale, and sort of the event is at the right, bound, at the right margin. So, um, so you're sort of accumulating ticket sales over time. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff you can get out of this. Um, the blue line there, which goes straight up and then over, that was 2017. So we had all this, that was the first year we were here at Stiefel, we had all this pent up demand and people were used to the conference selling out in five minutes. So they all showed up the day I went on sale and bought a ticket and we sold like, I don't know, 1,500 tickets that first, in the first you know, few hours. And uh, then I went and had a beer. <laughs> so that was a good day. <laughs> uh, that felt great. Uh, and then the next year, the green line, you can see that it, it kind of, uh, few people realized they didn't have to buy it right away, so they showed up the first day, but then after that it kind of trailed off. And the yellow line, same thing. That was 2019, the year that we had, a, uh, that was a rough year. Uh, and not, not enough people bought tickets that first day, for sure. Uh, and then it just kind of percolated along. And you can kind of see, if you look at those in particular, uh, I think it's remarkable how even, how, what, how even the slope is on ticket sales after that initial buy. Like that, that's not obvious to me that that was, it, it wasn't obvious to me. I've been watching this data for a long time, but so um, you, you sell like some number of tickets per day, like, and that's just math. You can calculate how many tickets you're gonna sell, you know? So um, that's actually incredibly useful information. I find this really, if you're organizing a conference or an event and you can track this kind of thing, uh, it's really useful. Um, and then you can, you can make decisions. The problem is it's hard to, there's some decisions that are hard to make late. Uh, so if you can make that decision to, to uh, fundamentally change the conference in a way that changes your budget, um, you know, uh, the first week tickets are on sale, you can do a lot of different things that you can't do you know, the last week. So, uh, so that, that's a really important lesson for me. Um, another thing that's not visible in this is that, uh, well, two things where this is kind of a, a little bit of an indirect metric, and I'm used to looking at it, so I know this, but the uh, tickets here is really anything that we sold through the registration system, so it includes like, you know, a, a what-if book or a <laughs> pre-conference workshop or something like that, so it's not exactly just tickets. Uh, and then the other thing is that cancellations aren't shown in here, it's just sales. So like uh, the 2021 20, line had a, hundreds of cancellations, so <laughs> the real number is much lower than, than what you see here, so those are the two pieces of context there. Uh, so uh, the black line is this year. So it's interesting, if you sell a constant number of tickets per day, then you could be open longer and sell more tickets, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I think that's true. I think that is a true thing, but maybe, maybe they would buy tickets later, but I don't think it's true. I think like people just show up and they, they, for whatever reason, they find the conference and if they could buy a ticket right then, they will. So if you open earlier, you can sell more tickets. I don't know. So. If you're doing an event, think about that. Um, there are a lot of risks involved in running a conference like this, um, and most of them are out of your control. <laughs> so um, there are ways to manage some of these kinds of things, um, but really you're just sort of rolling the dice every year and hoping that you make it through without some catastrophe happening. Um, and there are, you know, you can, you can, you can respond to some things, uh, and all of these, I, to some degree, have happened to us over the years. Um, but you, don't, you never know when the one's gonna happen. Uh, if you look at that last graph, well, the, the one thing I didn't mention is uh, you get profitable in the last like centimeter or inch of this graph, you know? <laughs> like you don't get profitable until, until maybe the last 
few weeks of the conference. Um, so the bulk of the time, you're just paying down your fixed costs for that kind of thing, uh, which leaves you big oceans of time to have something bad happen um, that you can't recover from. Uh, so it, it has, and this is, I would say, it generally has gotten worse over a year, or maybe I'm just more aware of it. I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure which one. <laughs> but uh, it, it, that's definitely a thing to be aware of. Uh, so what is the future of conferences? Uh, I think it's irresponsible at this point not to consider the climate impact of what we're doing here. I think it's really valuable, obviously. Um, and Crystal Lopez did a keynote about this in 2021. Um, if you wanna go look at that, she talks about a bunch of other things, mostly from the academic conference side. Um, but we have a big carbon footprint all flying here to talk, to hang out like this. Um, we've looked at carbon offsets uh, and thought about that. Um, I'm not convinced they're not a scam. <laughs> um, you tell, me, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but I, I, even if they're not a scam, I think it's definitely much better not to have the impact in the first place, uh, for sure. Um, and we sort of, you know, we all lived through the pandemic and, and did a lot of Zoom and, and virtual conferences and, and really, uh, I, I've done a bunch of virtual conferences and, and you know, just generally they suck. So <laughs> just uh, if I'm gonna <laughs> sum it up. Um, but it, I think it is important to think a little bit, why are they not as good? Uh, and there are a bunch of things. So let's go back to my trio of context, content, and people. So context, um, the, this idea of a third place is really important. So when you're at a virtual conference, where are you? You are probably at home in your first place or at work in your second place. And other people are in those places and they expect you to do the things you do in those places. Like, you know, go change, you know, empty the dishwasher or, you know, go to this meeting with your boss or whatever. And so uh, you do not have that, that really critical aspect of uh, the third place with a virtual conference. You're just stealing time from one of the other ones. And that is really hugely important. Uh, and then the other big thing is time zones, which wreck everything about virtual conferences. <laughs> so they make everything harder. Uh, the content is better in some ways. Like I think you're actually able, people are sitting close to a screen. They can actually see code and certain things I think better than they can on a big screen like this. So there's some, some things about that. And you have all these things like polls and, and Q&A and things like that. So you've got, um, you've got some things, that, some tools that are different. Um, so in some ways that's better, but doing talks is hard and doing remote talks I th I've found is just 10 times harder. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely not great. Uh, and then people, I find it's just way harder to connect with people you don't know through these virtual conference things. And I know there's these ones where you're like in a little town and you're walking around and you meet somebody or I don't know, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry if somebody here works for one of those companies, but um, I've, I, I haven't had a great, the only virtual conference experiences I've had that were really good were people that I knew well beforehand. So if you're in a, a, a good sort of a community that is you know, relatively, where you know a lot of the people, at least by reputation, um, I found that that, that can be okay uh, because you don't need as much of that sort of context making um, thing. Uh, so maybe VR is eventually the way out of some of these problems. Um, I certainly believe that five, ten years from now that you're going to be able to attend a meeting that it's not going to be, you know, like sitting at a Zoom call. It's going to be more like closer to sitting in a room with somebody. Um, I don't know exactly what that's going to be like uh, or whether you have to have something strapped to your face or not, but um, I, I do think that is going to be improved. But I don't think that solves anything about that third place problem. You're still sitting somewhere probably at that first or second place. Um, so is there something that is not a virtual conference and not a physical conference but is somewhere in between? And something uh, I have spent a lot of time sketching out because I thought really hard about doing this. And um, there are some hybrid alternatives that I think are actually pretty interesting. Um, you want to go somewhere, but what if you don't go far away? What if you go someplace close? What if you go to someplace in your city or somewhere in your region? Uh, and you could go hang out with people that you don't know necessarily, but that are there for an event, um, but not get on a plane. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of places these days for medium-sized groups to meet. Uh, a lot of companies now have fantastic places, you know, meeting rooms that are, you know, remote enabled and everything. Um, movie theaters are marketing things like this to companies now, so that's another whole uh, 
possibility for context that hasn't existed. And that's a place we already go for third place context. So um, I think that's, that's interesting. Um, I think if you think about sponsor things, sponsors who fly to a different place to then meet people who have flown from some other place and try to hire them is, uh, I think there's some problems with that model. <laughs> so um, it, it is not obvious to me that that's a great model. In, with remote, it's, it, maybe it's better than it w used to be. Um, but w just imagine the experience where you, you as a sponsor were able to host people and they came to your company and hung out in your conference room and talked to the people that worked at you, your company. Like that seems like a way higher value type of event um, for a sponsor. Uh, and, and the people are, by definition, probably close to that company already. Um, so, and speaking talent is all over. What if instead of um, presenting remote talks, you just pre you got together and presented talks locally uh, in the room and then sort of voted, recorded them, voted on which ones were the best ones, and then the next day you came back and watched the best talks from someplace else. Uh, you're never all synchronously together. You don't have the time zone problems. Um, I think there are, and I, I'm, not, I'm not solving all the problems here, but uh, I think there are interesting ideas here that could be, could be used to make something that's different than what we have now. And, and uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that someone here in this room or somewhere else, uh, somebody makes something like that. Uh, and then finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the ending, right? So many people have asked me why Strange Loop is ending, um, and uh, it really has achieved every goal I ever possibly imagined, and way beyond. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I really wanted a place that we could talk about these new languages and databases and stuff that I thought was interesting. Uh, I, I think we checked that box, <laughs> and uh, we, I wanted some way to mix sort of industry and academia and, and humanities stuff together. And I think I checked that box and bring people bringing people together, um, and talking about cool stuff and our passions, I think definitely check that box. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this idea of, of improving diversity in tech was another thing that we sort of picked up along the way. And, and I think we've, we've made a lot of important uh, things, that, important uh, uh, improvements there, uh, at least in moving what's expected of conferences and the, and the community. Um, uh, also, as I talked about earlier, it's gotten harder and riskier to do these events. So uh, every year, I think, is this a year that something happens and I go bankrupt and, and just fold it all up? And we, I've been close two or three times. Uh, it has, <laughs> we've been there. So, um, and then a lot of people have asked whether somebody could take over Strange Loop, and um, and I've had lots of people ask me. And um, the thing is that. Uh, this, one of the reasons that I think people sort of vibe with Strange Loop is it has a point of view. Uh, clearly, I, it's, a lot of it is my point of view <laughs> and the, the other organizers and all that. Um, and uh, I think that if somebody else was going to pick it up and, and do the conference, then they would be sort of cosplaying Strange Loop. Uh, and cosplay is cool, <laughs> but I don't think it would be the same. I think it would be, I, I don't think it would be, I, I, I would much rather see somebody uh, embrace their own idea and be 100% uh, themselves and putting together an event that uh, talks about their values and their interests and things like that. Um, so if you want to do something like that, you need advice, I'm happy to tell you what I know. So I, I have done this many times on, you know, gotten together with people on Zooms and, and talked them through event stuff and, and uh, I like the sort of business nuts and bolts of it. So like, oops, I'm happy to, uh, to do that if, uh, if you're interested. And then uh, finally, uh, I think it's okay for things to end. <laughs> so um, big, big trees in a forest sort of compete for their chunk of sky and all that corresponding life energy. And uh, big, big trees protect some young trees under the canopy. And, and when that big tree falls, the sky opens up, those young trees race up to fill it. Um, I hope that uh, Strange Loop Ending creates space in your life and mine. Uh, for other things to grow. So thank you for being here with us all these years, and I hope it's been as important a part of your life as mine.